We are delighted to have you join us at the virtual discussion of fresh water from the Our Planet um, docuseries. So we at the Geneva Environment Network um, is happy to collaborate with uh, WWF and the Geneva Water Hub in order to speak about um, this award-winning uh, series on fresh water. Today, we have with us um, two speakers, Dr. David Pickner, who is the Chief Freshwater Advisor for WWF UK. He is also a Visiting Research Fellow at the University of East Anglia. Um, David uh, provides strategic leadership to WWF's river conservation programs across the globe and guides the organization's engagement with governments, companies, and the expert community on water policy and practice. And we're also delighted to have with us from Geneva, Natasha Carmi, who is the lead water specialist at the Geneva Water Hub. Natasha joined the organization uh, last year and contributes greatly to the establishment of the Global Water Observatory on Water and Peace, as well as the development of the Women, Water and Peace Agenda. Prior to that, she also worked as a water policy advisor to the Palestinian Negotiation Support Project working closely with decision makers and has also experience in bilateral and regional water negotiations. We hope that you have enjoyed um, also our viewers uh, watching the documentary online prior to this discussion. And uh, may we kindly um, introduce to you our first speaker, which is Dave. So Dave, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malu. Let me just check if you can still hear me okay. Yes. Good, thanks. And hello to everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, I very much hope some of you have found the time to look at the Our Planet series as a whole, and in particular the freshwater episode that uh, is framing the series. And uh, we're very pleased to have had some involvement in it. What I'd like to with my time over the next 15 minutes or so is just complement what hopefully you've seen in the program with a bit of a, a big picture look at what's happening to the world's freshwater resources, what's, what's happening to the world's freshwater biodiversity in particular, um, a little bit of a discussion about why we should be concerned about that, uh, and then perhaps map a little bit of a pathway forward with um, some ideas of how we might solve some of the problems we're facing. I can have the next slide, please. We live on a, a blue planet, a planet that's covered in water. Um, or at least so it seems to us most of the time. But actually, when we look a little more carefully at the picture, there may not be quite as much water around as we think. Next slide, please. This slide I've borrowed from the US Geological Survey, uh, and it shows what Earth would look like if we were able to gather all the water on the planet up uh, into one place. And you can see over the Great Plains region of North America, uh, what would be a very large bubble, I think about 800 miles in diameter. That bubble is the total amount of water that's on planet Earth. Uh, and when we see it gathered up like that, it doesn't seem that Earth is quite so blue. Now, the thing to remember here, of course, is that most of that water is seawater, it's saline. <clears throat> and that, of course, is important habitat by itself. But if we're particularly concerned with fresh water, well, what we have to do is look at the smaller bubble, uh, just to the side of that over roughly, I think that would be sort of Pennsylvania. Um, that bubble, I think, is about 120 miles in diameter. So there's rather less fresh water than there is seawater on the planet. And of course, fresh water is important as a habitat for biodiversity, but also it's incredibly important for, for people. It's the water that we use to, to nourish our crops. It's the water we use to, to lubricate our industries and to make the stuff that we buy and use every day. It's the water that we rely on to drink and cook and clean ourselves. But the thing to remember about that fresh water is that the vast majority of that is either locked in ice caps or is so deep underground that it's effectively inaccessible. So the sharp eyed among you will see that there's a third tiny bubble uh, on the picture. And if I could have the next slide, just where that arrow is pointing over roughly Atlanta, 
That bubble is the total amount of surface water uh, on the planet. Uh, so lakes and rivers and other types of surface freshwater wetlands. That's the freshwater, which is critically important for human use uh, and as a habitat for freshwater species. And I'll talk a little bit more about freshwater biodiversity uh, in a moment. If I could have the next slide. When we see that picture, when we see that tiny, tiny bubble over Atlanta, that's the easily accessible surface freshwater on the planet. Perhaps it makes more sense to us why all the world's major religions, whether it's Islam, Christianity, or Buddhism, uh, all the world's major religions, in fact, have given priority to water in their spiritual religious rituals. Water is used to mark our passing into life and our passing into the afterlife. Next slide, please. Water also features prominently in pretty much all human cultures. Um, so whether it's uh, Strauss's The Blue Danube Waltz, or I think if you go back to that slide with Mark Twain on it, thank you. Or whether it's Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn uh, floating down the Congo in African Queen, or whether it's Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, which doesn't quite want to seem to stay on the screen. Um, water and rivers feature heavily in our culture. Now, if we could move on to that slide. Uh, water also suffuses our language. So uh, this is true in, in many languages around the world. In English, in my native language, uh, we talk about going with the flow. We talk about dipping our toes in the water. We talk about being up the creek without a paddle. We throw babies out with bath water if we're careless. Sometimes we take to things like a duck for water. The way water runs through our language shows just how important it is to our cultures and our societies. And of course, water is important to us in all sorts of practical ways as well. Next slide, please. We use water every day, often in rather surprising ways. So this slide shows the typical amount of water that's used by somebody like me, a normal person living in the UK, Precise numbers will vary from country to country, from person to person, of course. But the key thing to understand here is that the water we use isn't just the water that comes through our taps. Uh, the water we use is often hidden in the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the stuff we buy and use every day. And once we look at that, that embedded or virtual water, once we look at our total water footprint, we realize just how reliant we are on vast quantities of water to support our ways of life. Next slide, please. Let's get back to the wildlife. Freshwater habitats are incredibly important for wildlife. In fact, I think they're one of conservation's best kept secrets. Um, freshwater habitats, as you've seen from that, that bubble, uh, really cover only a tiny proportion of the Earth's surface. The precise statistics vary a little bit, um, but we're talking about between 1 and 3 percent of the Earth's surface. And yet, those freshwater habitats host something like one third of all known vertebrate species, including, and this is a remarkable statistic, right, including more fish species than are found in all the oceans. Freshwater habitats, rivers, lakes, wetlands, they're disproportionately important for wildlife. Given the cultural, spiritual, societal, economic importance of freshwater habitats, given how important they are for wildlife, you would imagine that we would take good care of them. Sadly, as I'm sure you know, having watched the Our Planet uh, episode, that isn't the case. So if we could move on to the next slide, that one there. There are a number of things we're doing to our water resources and to our freshwater habitats globally, which are causing problems. I don't have time to give you the exhausting list, the, the bewildering array of threats to the health of those systems. Um, but they cover things like pollution, invasive species, 
increasingly things like sand mining from rivers and from floodplains, which has devastating effect, effects on wildlife. Overfishing uh, is a, uh, another big issue. Just to highlight a couple though, in a bit more detail, one of the things we're doing is disrupting the connectivity uh, of our river systems. Connectivity is critically important to the health of freshwater habitats. If you think about it, rivers are linear flowing features that link one part of our landscape to another, that link one country to another, that link cities and countryside. If we build dams across those rivers, we disrupt that connectivity and that has devastating effects on wildlife. It acts as a barrier to things like fish migration. It also disrupts the flow of nutrients and sediment from upstream to downstream, which can have huge impacts on downstream habitat, uh, for example. And of course, building dams, though it can have um, bring economic and social benefits in some ways through hydropower, through flood defense, through water storage, it can also bring real impacts on people. Uh, conservative estimates are that something like half a billion people have had their lives or livelihoods adversely impacted by poorly planned dams around the world. This map here shows what we think is the extent of remaining large free flowing rivers around the planet. And what you can see, the, the areas in blue are the remaining free flowing rivers, and there are, there are hot spots for free flowing rivers in places like the Amazon and the Congo Basin, as part of Southeast Asia, and in particular in the, the far north and in the Arctic. But pretty much everywhere else across Europe, North America, large parts of Asia, large parts of Southern Eastern Africa and Latin America, Australia, Australia we have lost our free flowing rivers. Next slide, please. Alongside that, we're increasingly simply sucking rivers and lakes and wetlands dry. This graph shows total global water withdrawals over the last 100 years or so. And what you can see is a, a massive increase, in particular since 1950, since the Great Acceleration, as it's sometimes called, uh, population increase and, and economic change that took on the world after the Second World War. Most of that has come through agriculture. Um, now, it's important to say here that this isn't just about population increase. In fact, over the last hundred years or so, we think global population has increased by about fourfold. Global water withdrawals have increased by seven or eightfold. So there aren't just more of us, it's the fact we're living, or at least many of us are living, thirstier lifestyles. And that water, sometimes it comes from aquifers, very often it comes from rivers or lakes. And we see disasters like the Aral Sea in Central Asia, these huge habitats which have quite literally been sucked almost dry. Next slide, please. All of this plays out for freshwater wildlife in really quite shocking ways. This graph comes from WWF's Living Planet report, which was published just a couple of months ago. It shows the Freshwater Living Planet Index. The Living Planet Index is an average of populations of freshwater vertebrate species around the world. If you like, it's like a stock index, like the FTSE 100 or the Dow Jones. What we see is that since 1970, which is about the earliest we can get reliable data, there's been an 84% decrease in the stock index. In other words, the average population size of freshwater vertebrates across the world has decreased by more than four feet. Now just think about that for a moment. Ask yourself this, if the actual financial stock indexes, if the FTSE 100 or Dow Jones had increased by this amount, what would governments be doing? What would businesses and financial institutions be doing? I think we've seen from what's happened over the last year or so that when disaster strikes, governments and businesses, indeed all of us, can take really quite remarkable action to try to address disasters. This is, by any count, a disaster. It's a disaster that's happened in relative slow motion compared to COVID, but it is nevertheless a complete disaster. Now, for me, this graph, although I've talked about this graph a lot of times over the years, for me, it's taken on a bit of a personal 
dimension because this graph effectively tracks my lifetime. I was born in late 1969, just on the left hand side of this graph. I've only ever known a world in which there is less and less wildlife, in particular, in which there is less and less fresh water wildlife. I imagine that's true for most people sitting in on this call. More than that, my little boy was born just on the right hand side of this graph in late 2015. Next slide, please. So the question going through my mind increasingly these days is, what kind of world will my little boy know? Will he know a world which even from that low baseline is even more impoverished in terms of wildlife, in terms of healthy ecosystems? Is that the world we want him to grow up in? Or can he grow up in a world in which there's more wildlife, a world that is richer in biodiversity, a world in which our ecosystems, our habitats are healthy, can we bend that curve back upwards? He's five years old now. He's a bit young to take the kind of decisions that will determine the answer to that question. In fact, the answer to that question can really only be determined by us, by the grown-ups in this world. Next slide, please. And there's reason for hope. We're seeing more and more attention being paid to environmental issues, including water risks. And many of the, the things I talked about which threaten our freshwater wildlife are also threats to our economies and societies. So we see headlines like these in newspapers. We hear powerful leaders like Hillary Clinton or Xi Jinping making speeches about the need for rivers to be healthier, about the need for us to take greater action to take care of our water resources. The world is just beginning to wake up I think. But of course, there's far more to do. Next slide, please. So what can we do? How do we bend that curve back upwards? I've been leading a, a major piece of work for WWF over the last year and a half or so to try to address that question. We assembled uh, about 25 of the world's best experts on freshwater ecosystems on science and policy dimensions of freshwater ecosystems. Really to try to answer that question, what is it we need to do to recover freshwater biodiversity to make our ecosystems healthy? We published what we think is the answer uh, in a paper earlier this year, uh, and we styled it as an emergency recovery plan because we think the situation demands that kind of action. In fact, I was surprised that the scientists who I thought would be the cool kind of among us, uh, who would want to restrain from, or refrain from using dramatic language, they were the ones who, say, who were saying, humanitarian disaster, we need to call this an emergency group. Uh, and I won't go through all the details there, but involves addressing things like uh, river flows and over withdrawal of water, it involves addressing things like poorly planned dams. It involves addressing things like pollution. The key thing about this plan is that every single thing we suggested in it has already been implemented in at least one location on the planet. It's a plan that's rooted in it's doable, in other words. The challenge is to scale up those ad hoc successes to uh, shift the pattern of the way we manage freshwater ecosystems globally. Next slide, please. Yes, there you go. Uh, and there's a huge opportunity coming up to try and stimulate that. Uh, one of the casualties of the whole COVID situation was a uh, big international convention. About now, in fact, there were, there were two or three big international conventions that were supposed to happen around the sustainability space. Uh, this autumn. One was a review of progress against the sustainable development. One was the UN Framework Convention Change Conference of Part 26, which was supposed to be happening about now, in fact, 
in, here in the UK. And the other was uh, a meeting of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity. The fact that all three of these things were together led many people to say that 2020 would be the super year for sustainability. Uh, of course, the world changed, and all those things have effectively postponed 2021. 2021 looking like a real opportunity to bring about some kind of paradigm shift, not just for water, not just for freshwater biodiversity, but for the deeply in problems of climate change and nature loss and for opportunities to improve people's lives in, in a way that is badly needed. If we can integrate the emergency recovery plan for fresh diversity into some of those mechanisms, into the SDGs, into the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, into the Convention on Biological Diversity, that could stimulate real policy change, real change in practice, real financial investment in the kind of solutions that are needed. So for us at WWF and for many of the partners we work with, that is now the big game in town, and that's what we're working towards. Next slide, please. And happily, we're beginning to see some progress. We've seen organizations like UN Water take account of our emergency recovery plan and build on it in its technical inputs to the Convention on Biological Diversities processes particularly processes to define a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Very happily, we saw out of the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, the Global Biodiversity Outlook Report that was published uh, recently. That uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook published um, or included a number of what it called transitions, uh, pathways, if you like, from, from the unsustainable way we're currently managing some, some ecosystems and natural resources to more sustainable ways of doing it. The sustainable freshwater transition or pathway was very heavily based on our emergency recovery plan, which we were delighted to see. So progress is being made. These ideas are moving forward, but of course, much more needs to be done. I'm gonna stop there for now. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. If we could just flick on to the final slide, just one last sharing of that panda logo. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Dave. And so now we uh, head to the next speaker, which is uh, Natasha Carmi from the Geneva Water Hub. So Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, David, for a very interesting uh, and stimulating uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, first, allow me to congratulate you uh, on showcasing those global challenges of access to fresh water in the series uh, on the wilderness areas and their wildlife it was really uh, an interesting and comprehensive documentary uh, the messages are very clear uh, and they cannot but actually speak to the responsibility that lies on the shoulders of mankind um, thank you for inviting us to geneva water hub um, to present uh, yet another angle, uh, also forward-looking and as positive uh, as the one that is being carried uh, forward by WWF, uh, you know, on the issue of the freshwater biodiversity, and that's from the angle of the global water and peace nexus, uh, and uh, the uh, both in facing the challenges that were outlined and also. Uh, in uh, providing uh, opportunities. So, uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, the Geneva Water Hub is a center of excellence of the University of Geneva specialized in hydro diplomacy that was established in 2014. Um, with my presentation, I will actually uh, try to pick up uh, from the final messages of the freshwater documentary which focused on the need to actually manage the flow, the ability to do it, and uh, to determine how to share it by focusing really on the role of humankind in using water as a vehicle for peace, using as key pillars good governance and transboundary and local water cooperation. Next slide, please. Freshwater management uh, is a very complex issue. 
Um, there are different and competing uses for water, including wash, agriculture was also mentioned by uh, David, um, the hydropower energy generation, industry, navigation, which was actually the main factor that led to the conclusion of the earliest water agreements, nature, and also another aspect that the, David mentioned, which is the spiritual or the cultural aspect. The water cycle is the same since the beginning of humanity. It, what has changed is basically the way in which we manage it and which is problematic. We talk about pollution, competition, overuse, inefficient use. Bottom line, we are talking about poor governance. In addition, uh, as the documentary showcased, we are challenged by floods, droughts, glaciers, climate change, and population growth. In terms of figures, uh, I mean, we recognize that 45% of the world GDP may actually originate in water stressed countries. And it is projected that, you know, half of the world population will be living in a water stressed region in 2050. In the reports of the WEF, the World Economic Forum, since 2014 and until uh, recently, water has been ranked as one of the uh, three highest global risks. Next, please. A key example of the interventions that exacerbate conflicts is actually the construction of dams. As you see in the slide, not only do we have a large number of constructed dams, but we are actually planning to build another half of the number, existing number of dams, and each dam by itself creates already conflicts. Next, please. Next. And next, please. So if, if we try to look and summarize some of the uh, you know, global uh, challenges, our main water resources are transboundary. We have 263 transboundary lakes and rivers, which cover nearly half of the Earth's land surface, with a total of 145 nations whose territories include international basins. The other aspect is basically, which is often neglected, is the groundwater aspect. 99% of all accessible freshwater on this planet is found in aquifers. In addition, at the local level, we are also seeing the emergence of increasing intersectorial conflicts. And within the past years, there have been increasing warnings about the possibility of water conflicts, water shortages that are coupled with poverty, societal instability, all of which could actually weaken interstate cohesion and fuel interstate conflicts. Next, please. So how do we handle those challenges? To start with, experience has shown that in many situations, rather than causing open conflict, the need for water sharing induces cooperation. But despite the complexity of the problems, water disputes can be handled diplomatically, and even water sharing can become a catalyzer for collaboration in conflict situations. It is with this positive vision that the Geneva Water Hub has been established. Our focus is basically blue diplomacy or what within the framework of the overall blue peace movement. Next, please. For us at the Geneva Water Hub, we consider hydro diplomacy as a strategic tool which is used to reconcile conflicting interests, including and beyond water, based on the increasing global recognition of the water peace nexus. We consider that water diplomacy is another form of preventive diplomacy that adopts a multidisciplinary approach, innovative tools that use water as a vehicle for peace and a bridge that connects the development and peace agendas. Peace, according to us, is not the absence of armed conflict, but it is rather the prevalence of sustainable development. Next, please. On the 16th of November 2015, 
The Global High Level Panel on Water and Peace was launched by 15 co-convening countries with the Geneva Water Hub as its secretariat. Within two years and after many consultations and roundtable discussions in Geneva, Dakar, Costa Rica and Amman, the panel released its final recommendations in the report A Matter of Survival in September 2017. This is the first time that such a reflection of this magnitude has been launched on the issue of water and peace. The report addresses and frames the issue of water and peace through seven major chapters of recommendations. Next, please. Next, please. I will not. Next, please. Yeah, it's just the slide before. No. One more. <laughs> you need to go further up. In all cases, I, I just wanted to show you, to give you um, an overall of the different chapters, the different uh, thematics that were covered uh, by the uh, report of the panel. Uh, it looked at the drama of water, what could be done you know, at the global level, water in armed conflict, uh, the issue of data, quality, quantity, um, the uh, legal frameworks that exist, um, the financing of transboundary water infrastructures and new mechanisms for uh, hydro diplomacy. I'm sorry that you couldn't uh, see that slide, but um, so, Can we go to the to just one one slide up, please? Yes, this one. So um, since the launching of the report uh, of the of the panel, the Geneva Water Hub has been implementing and overseeing the development of the key recommendations of the panel with its partners. Date there have been two main reports that outline the progress, determined steps in 2019, and intensified action in 2020. A third analytic report of the Global Observatory on Water and Peace is due within the upcoming months. But before I talk about the Global Observatory, allow me first to describe the framework and the main axis and outcomes of the operationalization of this water and peace nexus that I am talking about. Next, please. So, the overall framework the bigger outer ring consists of the three main agendas which United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his remarks to the General Assembly on taking oath to office recognized as three sides of the same triangle, humanitarian response, sustainable development and sustaining peace. Of course, these three agendas are present within the Geneva International and they are at the center of its reflections. While institutions in Geneva work and reflect on these topics, those in New York develop the related positions. The Geneva Water Hub has three main functions. The circles in blue in the middle, basically naming um, the think tank component, the research and education, and the advocacy. In the operationalization of the recommendations of the panel and this global agenda on water and peace, the Geneva Water Hub functions through three, uh, four main outcomes. In addition, there are several interventions that are being uh, undertaken in order to uh, complete uh, the, um, the implementation of these uh, activities. Next, please. I would like to revert back to the Global Observatory on Water and Peace, whose report was mentioned earlier, and to provide you more background to it. Um, I think, no, you jumped one slide. One up. During the discussions of the panel uh, with the stakeholders within the period of two years, 
one particular reflection was about international cooperation. And it was clear that was a, there was a gap in this international cooperation beyond the technical water management. Often when we talk about cooperation, we are talking about joint water committees or commissions or institutions. And the gap that existed was how to look beyond that water management, especially when we are trying to leverage the potential of water as a tool of peace building and conflict prevention. The panel concluded that there was a need for a global network, not a new institution, one that would actually facilitate the expansion of water cooperation by providing a trusted, impartial clearinghouse for promising initiatives. The observatory was launched at the 5th Arab Water Week uh, in uh, March 2019. Next, please. So how does this network or platform look like? It's actually a network of nodes, institutes, organizations of different natures. Sorry, no, you're moving through which reflect the analysis and strategic foresight capability on water and peace, each one in their specific context, whether it's within their region or within its society. And this kind of reflection is carried out in a creative dynamic exchange, and it contributes to creating a discrete global space in which we could progress on key themes of regional or societal context either of generic scope or of global scope. Next, please. Sorry. Yeah, um, I would also like to highlight another component which might be relevant to uh, those that are attending the session today and who are focusing on environment issues very similar uh, in line with the work that is being done on promoting the protection of environment in armed conflict. As part of the recommendations also of the panel, the uh, Geneva Water Hub with its partners uh, developed the Geneva list of principles on the protection of water infrastructure, which is actually a, compend a compendium of existing uh, laws, humanitarian, international water law, that uh, enforce or that encourage the production of the uh, key infrastructures, whether they are water infrastructures or related infrastructures uh, during armed conflict. And the objective is basically to enforce a legal framework on water in armed conflict. Next, please. Before uh, I move on to the last part of my presentation, I would just like to uh, take a moment to highlight an issue which is often not treated enough, which we usually talk about lakes and rivers. However, we do not talk enough about groundwater aquifers, possibly due to the fact that they are unseen. So within the discussions on water management, on fresh water, uh, the aquifers are often neglected whereas they have the potential to contribute to resolving existing challenges. One of these examples that I would like to mention to explain the dynamics of the uh, kind of cooperation that could exist around aquifers uh, is to uh, mention a current collaboration among the riparian countries to the Senegal Senegalo-Mauritanian Aquifer Basin, which was actually initiated following the commemoration of the 40th anniversary for the signing of the Geneva Aquifer Agreement. Today, a commission of experts that is designated by the riparian countries is working together and is trying to identify opportunities of collaboration within this large-scale aquifer basin in order to be able to mitigate challenges that exist today and are projected uh, in the future. So. Another key development, uh, which might be interesting, uh, basically, is the aspect uh, that is related to the culture and the spiritual dimension of water that, again, uh, David also mentioned. We at the Geneva Water Hub consider that art and culture is an important actor in the reflection around the water and peace nexus. 
Thank you for your attention and kindly do not hesitate to reach out for questions and or discussions. Thank you very much, Natasha. And uh, thank you very much again, Dave. So now we head on to the Q&A session of our virtual discussion. Um, I will summarize them um, in two parts based on the questions that we have received directly through messages, through the WebEx uh, Q&A uh, platform, and also through Facebook. One, for instance, um, evolves around biodiversity. So the questions are, disrupting rivers connectivity affects biodiversity. How do you compete with urbanization and industrial development? As consumers, what are sustainable choices in consuming freshwater fish? And finally, is there any place or region in the world that can serve as a role model in terms of conserving freshwater biodiversity where species are actually increasing and there is a limited um, loss of free flowing rivers um, through dam? The next set of uh, questions uh, evolved around uh, governance and policy. How do we push government's agenda to move towards a better management in freshwater sources? Where should this movement towards a more sustainable use of water start? Should it uh, start from governance bodies, from industries, or the general public? And it seems that the stopper to move towards more sustainable practices, for example, carbon tax, are slowed down by politicization on certain topics. Can we depoliticize climate change? And lastly, how do you monitor the impact of the Geneva Water Hub on a global scale? So I will uh, leave it first, uh, perhaps for David, um, to uh, answer some of the questions and then later to Natasha. Thank you. Thanks, Malu, and thanks to everybody who posed those questions. They're all really, really good questions. And I think we could spend at least an hour discussing any one of them individually. Um, so apologies if I don't quite do them justice. Um, there was a lot in there. I, I hope I've I've captured some of it. Um, there was one question about uh, in terms of managing freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity. How do we do that in, when we're in competition with with development, with industrial and urban development in particular? I think the question was. There are undoubtedly some trade-offs that that need to be made. You know, we, we as people need to use water. Uh, and that means that not all of our rivers, lakes, wetlands, not all of our aquifers, to pick up on Natasha's important point about groundwater, we can't leave all of them in absolutely pristine condition just for the wildlife. Uh, our freshwater ecosystems, many of them need to be what I've heard other people call working rivers, for example, you can have working aquifers or lakes. That doesn't preclude them being healthy. So and there are a number of techniques we can use, scientific tools, governance approaches, which can help us achieve a better balance. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, it is possible, and we're beginning to see this happen more uh, in a number of different places, it is possible to devise water management regimes, in particular around allocation of water for different uses, in such a way that the rivers are left to keep flowing, at least with some water in them. So there are, there are tools uh, like environmental flow assessment, for example, which basically revolve around talking to people about what they want their river to look like in future and how they plan to use that river. And using that to come up with scenarios of how much water could be taken out of the river at different times, uh, for different uses. Combining that with assessments about uh, who needs water for what, uh, thinking about the economics of that, but also social justice implications of, of water sharing uh, and what necessary transboundary dimensions of, of water sharing, to come up with really quite sophisticated water allocation plans and regimes that provide people with the water that they need to at least fill their basic needs and, and possibly to also fulfill their, their economic needs as well. Um, whilst maintaining some of the key attributes of, of freshwater ecosystem health. 
this touches as well on, on one of the other questions, which, which I think was around success stories. Where have we seen progress around the world? I, I'm a big believer in trying to document successes and share them to inspire similar uh, to inspire people to take on similar approaches or to adapt similar approaches in other parts of the world. And we did a piece of work a couple of years ago looking at water allocation and so water infrastructure design and operation in a number of places around the world where we had made progress, where water was being left in the river or returned to the river, but in such a way that, that people were happy with. And we published a report, it was called Listen to the River, specifically documenting eight success stories from a number of different types of contexts around the world where that has happened. And what that tells me is it is possible, it can be done. Sometimes it's a long-term process. It's fundamentally entwined with some of the governance issues that Natasha was talking about. It's also fundamentally a social and political process as well. Maybe that takes me to one of the other questions that was asked. Um, which is around the politics of, of all of this. I think the question was specifically around the politics of climate change, which isn't my area of expertise, but, but I suspect the politics of water management is, is just as challenging and profound. Um, fundamentally, these are political processes. And I think one of the things that, that perhaps the conservation movement, and I, I'd even say the water management community, um, hasn't got right in recent decades is acknowledging the political dimensions of all of this and really trying to inform uh, political processes, political decisions to end up with, with improved governance, with improved environmental, social, and where, where appropriate economic outcomes as well. I do see that that's beginning to shift. I think a number of us in the conservation movement, at least, are beginning to understand that, that we have to without being overtly political ourselves, we have to provide information and frame potential, potential solutions in ways which resonate with broader political priorities. Um, and, and we are beginning to see some of that happen in places. The Danube Basin immediately comes to mind, for example. I think there's been quite a lot of progress over the last 15 or 20 years. But within the broader political framing of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and, and the communist bloc, for example, the desire of many Eastern European countries to accede to the European Union, uh, and the role that water management, wetland management, freshwater conservation can play in supporting those bigger political priorities. So I see signs of progress, but, but I think there's more to be done in documenting success stories, and in particular in understanding how we can make progress within these broader political contexts. Thank you, Dave. Um, Natasha, would you like to uh, add um, to those questions, answers? Um, I think when we're talking about, there was a question basically about, you know, how to push, um, you know, government agendas. Um, uh, and I think that is exactly, you know, what this, um, you know, there has been a change and there has been a change, you know, uh, by uh, if we go back, you know, to the um, recognition and the statement that was made, you know, by the UN Secretary General, uh, in a sense, you know, that there is basically a recognition of the interlinkages, this triangle of the uh, three main agendas. Um, in uh, in the world, you know, looking at the development, at the peace, um, and uh, the humanitarian, uh, as uh, there's an interconnectedness between them, and that means that the way that these uh, you know agendas are uh, interrelated related to the daily lives uh, of people is is very important. So uh, I would actually emphasize again what David said that it is up to us basically to be able to concretize these messages and what these changes mean in order for the decision makers to be able uh, to, to take it uh, forward. Uh, on, on the question, there was basically a question on basically how do we monitor, for example, uh, you know, the impact uh, of uh, the Geneva Water Hub uh, on a global scale. 
I mean, the, the whole nexus and this whole approach, this water and peace agenda, you know, uh, did not exist uh, prior to uh, the work uh, of the global high level uh, panel uh, on water and peace. This is a new, you know, agenda that has uh, been increasing, is, is increasingly being uh, recognized. And due to the work of the panel, you know, due to the, um, uh, basically the discussions that are taking place with decision makers, we have actually for the first time, you know, in 2017, the UN Security Council had actually convened uh, a thematic session, uh, you know, on transboundary water cooperation as it relates to peace building. And since 2017, this is something that we haven't seen before. There have been uh, other sessions that at the Security Council that looked also into water as it relates to uh, security. Hence, there is this, you know, ball that has started uh, to roll, you know, and uh, basically we see that Again, it's a process. The change is a process. However, there is more and more uh, uh, recognition uh, on this. There's also, you know, at the global level, uh, there is uh, basically a commission now, uh, you know, an expert commission, which is, again, looking into the role that the water has in peace building that will be presenting its recommendations uh, to the uh, UN uh, Security Council. At the Geneva Water Hub, I mean ourselves, we have uh, undergone an external evaluation in order to evaluate uh, the um, impact of the work that we are doing uh, on the uh, peace agenda. I hope that answers, you know, to that question that was put forward on the impact um, if there are any other uh, questions that um, I have missed, uh, Malou, maybe you could uh, just uh, remind me. Yes, it's uh, mainly about also the policies. Um, should it start from the government or the industry or also the private sector? Well, uh, the work that we are doing basically, you know, uh, is it tackles different, you know, levels and different societies. There is one particular, you know, uh, chapter uh, uh, that speaks to the recommendations of the panel that is entitled People's Diplomacy. And this is very much focused, you know, on the role of the uh, local population and the role of the local stakeholders, not basically just as stakeholders uh, you know, in project implementations, but uh, stakeholders in decision making. Hence, as part of the work, for example, of the Global Observatory on Water and Peace that I mentioned with the different, you know, nodes, there are nodes that include the youth, that include women, that include uh, the media, that include also the local voices and the culture. So I think the impact in terms of policies and uh, the change in policies has to be done, you know, through the work of these uh, different uh, entities working together. Okay, thank you very much, Natasha. So we would like to thank once again, Dave and Natasha for their time today to speak with us at the virtual discussion. And we would also like to thank our viewers for joining us today.